Hello and welcome to Indus News. Live from Islamabad, I'm Naila Shudra and these are the headlines. Iran's Guardian Council has approved a law obliging the government to halt United Nations inspections of nuclear sites. The council was last hurdle in the legal process before the law came into effect. The law also approved stepping up uranium enrichment beyond the limits set under the 2015 nuclear deal. Pakistan has welcomed the agreement reached on the rules and procedures by the Afghan parties in Doha. At a foreign office briefing, spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhry turned the development another significant step forward. The foreign office spokesperson said Pakistan will continue to support intra-Afghan negotiations. Meanwhile, United States military says it will keep two larger bases in Afghanistan despite reducing number of troops to 2,500 by January 15. Speaking at a think tank, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley said the United States military will continue aiding Afghan security forces and carrying out operations against ISIS and Al-Qaeda. His statement comes a day after the Kabul administration and the Taliban reached a preliminary deal to press on with peace talks. The United States has reported the highest number of COVID-19 deaths in a single day. The virus claimed 2,658 lives in the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, India remains the second worst hit country with more than 9.5 million cases. Pakistan has registered nearly 3,500 cases and 39 deaths overnight, taking the toll to over 8,200. Globally, the virus has claimed nearly 1.5 million lives and infected 64.5 million people. And in football, Paris Saint-Germain has defeated Manchester United 3-1 in a Group H clash at the UEFA Champions League at Old Trafford. Brazilian Neymar scored twice to die by his side against the 10 men United after midfielder Frederico Rodriguez was sent off. For news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. An Iranian watchdog has approved a law obliging the government to halt United Nations inspections of nuclear sites. The Guardian Council also urged the Iran to stop up uranium enrichment beyond the limit set under the 2015 deal. Under the new law, the Iran will give two months to European parties to ease sanctions on Iran's oil and financial sectors. The powerful 12-member council approved the strategic act to revoke sanctions despite government opposition. President Hassan Rouhani has termed the parliament's move harm to diplomatic efforts aimed at easing U.S. sanctions. But the stance of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who has the last word on all matters of the state, is not known.
For more on this, we're joined by Habib Abdul Hussein, an analyst from Tehran. Thank you so much for your time. The Council has given the final approval to a bill aimed at further reducing Tehran's nuclear commitments. Can this bill be considered Iran's response to the assassination of its top nuclear scientist, Mohan Sinfahrizad? Well, Iran has already said that uh, it will respond to the assassination and uh, it will take practical steps. This can be one part of the practical step, but the response is already there. I mean, uh, Iranians uh, uh, have tried to be strategically patient over the past years after uh, signing the nuclear deal with the P5 plus one group of countries. Uh, but the, the retaliation and response is something else. Iran uh, reserves the right, it says, of course, to retaliate. And this is not the first time uh, Fakhrizad was the fifth Iranian scientist to be assassinated and apparently, according to many reports, by Israel. So uh, the issue of retaliation is different. But yes, this is this comes in the fallout over the assassination of Fakhrizadeh, and it see it is seen as sort of practical, uh, practical solutions and practical approach by the Iranian parliament, which uh, already criticizes the government for not taking uh, actually firm and decisive action over the JCPOA and the other sides, I mean, the European and the US, a lack of commitment, what they call. Mr. Abdul Hussein, the United States President-elect Joe Biden has said he is still committed to his promise of returning to the nuclear deal. Can this bill damage global diplomatic efforts in restoring the 2015 nuclear deal? Well, I think, uh, uh, this will also serve as a pressure leverage against uh, President-elect Biden uh, because it's just a matter of who is going to take the first step. Biden says that if Iranians are in full compliance with the deal, then they will start to remove the sanctions. But this is not how Iranians view the situation. They want the U.S. to take the first step, and that is... Uh, revoking the sanctions and removing uh, the punishment against uh, Iran. So this will be a sort of complicated for both sides, especially for Americans and President Biden, given the fact that uh, Donald Trump has already scorched, scorched the airs for diplomacy. And he is expected to continue this path over the weeks to come, you know, in his final days in office. So Iranians are more demanding and expect Joe Biden to take the first step. And they're not uh, supposed to do actually the same thing unless the U.S. stops and revokes the sanctions. Habib Abdul Hussein, thank you so much for talking to Indus News. Moving on. Pakistan has welcomed the agreement reached on rules and procedures by the Afghan parties in Doha. At a foreign office briefing, spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhry termed the development another significant step forward. Chaudhry said the agreement reflects a common resolve of the parties to secure a negotiated settlement. The foreign office spokesperson said Pakistan will continue to support the intra-Afghan negotiations. He said Islamabad hopes the dialogue will lead to an inclusive, broad-based and comprehensive political solution. Chaudhry said such a political settlement will pave the way for a peaceful, stable and prosperous Afghanistan. The United States military says it will keep two larger bases in Afghanistan despite reducing troops to 2,500 by January 15th. Speaking at a think tank, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley said the United States military will continue aiding Afghan security forces and carrying out operations against ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Milley said the United States will also help several satellite bases. The top United States general said Washington had achieved a modicum of success in Afghanistan. 
Afghanistan. He termed negotiated political settlements with power sharing as the most effective way to end the conflict. This comes after the Kabul administration and the Taliban reached a preliminary deal to press on with the peace talks. United States President Donald Trump has once again renewed his unsubstantiated electoral fraud allegations. Trump's video messages on social media come a day after Attorney General William Barr ruled out massive electoral fraud. This report has more. Despite suffering major setbacks on legal fronts, with courts dismissing lawsuits on electoral fraud, the U.S. president persists his defiance and refuses to concede defeat in the presidential election. In video message, President Trump reaffirmed his resolve to keep up his fight against the outcome. The president claimed there is overwhelming evidence, but many in media and the judiciary disagree with him. Trump said he had tens of thousands of ballots needed to overturn the results in battleground states. We already have the proof, we already have the evidence, and it's very clear. Many people in the media, and even judges so far, have refused to accept it. They know it's true, they know it's there, they know who won the election, but they refuse to say, you're right. Our country needs somebody to say, you're right. President Trump has so far refused to concede defeat and his legal team continues to file legal challenges to the outcome. Meanwhile, his personal attorney Rudy Giuliani has presented several witnesses before Michigan House Oversight Committee. Giuliani's key witness, Melissa Caron, said she saw at least 30,000 ballots counted multiple times. This election, I will say, it, they took, these Democrats took every avenue possible to commit fraud in this election. And what I saw on the third and fourth was over 20 counts of fraud being taken place in front of my face. And this isn't counting, you know, the ballots that are found in rivers, the ballots found under rocks. Giuliani blasted Barr for failing to thoroughly investigate the evidence he uncovered of widespread voter fraud. The United States has reported the highest number of COVID-19 deaths in a single day. The virus claimed 2,658 lives in the last 24 hours. Meanwhile, India remains the second worst hit country with more than 9.5 million cases. Globally, the virus has claimed nearly 1.5 million lives and infected more than 64.5 million people. More about the coronavirus in this report. The world now appears to be just days away from the first rollout of a coronavirus vaccine. But U.S. officials warn the pandemic will pose the country's grimmest health crisis yet over the next few months before vaccines become widely available. Most Americans might not have access to a vaccine till June 2021. Hospitalizations from the virus topped 100,000, more than double the number at the beginning of November. By the end of December, uh, the administration suggests that there'll be enough to, to vaccinate 20 million people with two dosages, which is 40 million dosages. Uh, that means 6% of Americans. Gives you an idea of where we're going to be coming into January. Uh, and those 6% will be prioritized as the healthcare workers, uh, seniors in congregate facilities, et cetera. Europe, meanwhile, has been forced to dampen its Christmas celebrations amid the ongoing surge. Italy has banned the midnight Christmas mass and all movement between regions amid high COVID toll. Spain has capped year-end parties at 10 people, restricting all domestic travel as the country's healthcare systems near a collapse. Germany, too, has decided to extend its COVID-19 restrictions until January. If the infection incidence continues to develop the way we have been seeing in the last days, then we will meet again on January 4. The federal states will extend their measures from December 20 until January 10. This means that basically we continue as we are now, with the exception of the special Christmas measures, until January 10. Despite being a rare success story, Australia has ruled out an early opening of international borders. The country aims to complete a review of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine by January 2021, despite UK approval. While Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered a large-scale voluntary vaccination program from next week. Moscow will have produced 2 million doses of its own vaccine within the next few days.
In Pakistan, 39 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours, raising the death toll to over 8,200. The health ministry says nearly 3,500 people tested positive for the disease overnight. The ministry said there are more than 51,000 active COVID-19 cases in the country. It said out of over nearly 407,000 countrywide cases, close to 347,000 have recovered so far. The ministry said over 177,000 cases have been detected in the province of Sindh, while the Punjab has reported over 121,000 cases. The capital, Islamabad, over 31,000 have been detected so far. The United Nations adopted a resolution presented by Pakistan and Philippines on religious harmony and peace. The resolution has been approved with a majority of 90 votes in the General Assembly, while no country voted against it. Introducing the draft, the permanent representative of Pakistan, Ambassador Munir Akram, said Prime Minister Imran Khan has repeatedly called on the United Nations and international community to counter Islamophobia and promote peace. Akram said deliberate vilification and negative stereotyping of Muslims only perpetuates clash of civilizations. Referencing France offensive caricatures, he said condoning provocative actions only encourages cultural disharmony. Akram said the resolution also acknowledges the call of high representative of the United Nations Alliance of Civilization, which discredited religious mockery. Human rights groups have urged Bangladesh to stop its plan to ship thousands of Rohingya refugees to a remote island. This comes as Bangladeshi officials said the first group of 400 refugees could leave later in the day. In a statement, Amnesty International said the authorities should immediately halt relocation of more refugees to Bushan Char. U.S.-based advocacy group Refugees International said the plan was short-sighted and inhumane, while the Fortify rights group said the relocation may be coerced and involuntary and should cease immediately. Earlier, Bangladeshi officials said shifting refugees to Basan Char Island will ease overcrowding in its camps at Cox Bazaar. Over 730,000 Rohingya Muslims fled Myanmar in 2017 following a vicious military crackdown. Welcome back. We're showing you the interview of DGISPR Major General Babur Iftikhar. According to the report of $500 million and has raised over 700 militiamen to disrupt the CPEC corridor. Now, what is the nature of the threat that you're facing here and how will you ensure the security of the corridor? Well, uh, Indians uh, see uh, CPEC as a, as a game changer mm -hmm. for the region and it is, it is a game changer for the region. Uh, it's uh, offering connectivity to the whole region and uh, with that Pakistan becomes a connectivity hub for this whole region and uh, I think this is a this is this is a game changer in the sense that it, it this project has the the ability the potential to bring prosperity to this whole region by connecting everyone it's not just a north-south thing so uh, the and for Pakistan, for Pakistan, it's it's basically it's basically an economic economic uh, project, and that's what the project's name also says, Sana Pakistan Economic Corridor. So the kind of threat that it is facing from the Indians is uh, obviously they've started uh, uh, with a you know. Uh, the, the, the security uh, threats that we are facing. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, terrorist activity going on around it. And uh, they've also started, uh, you know, bringing in some very uh, strange arguments about uh, where it starts from and where it ends. And um, how Indians are not very comfortable with the project passing through uh, certain territories in Pakistan. Uh, so the security threat around the project and different uh, different uh, uh, stages of the project uh, it has it has uh, actually been increasing mm -hmm. with the passage of time. Somewhere Indians decided that there is a timeline beyond which this project becomes irreversible. Okay. And uh, 
they feel that uh, the progress of this project must be retarded as much as possible so that it doesn't cross that timeline and uh, it can be somehow so you're saying that Indians fear this project as a game changer um, and that it will bring prosperity to the region so that I can clearly understand this are you saying that Indians are against the prosperity of the region is that why they're destroying CPEC because if they're not uh, willing to let this project uh, progress mm -hmm. then uh, that's what they're trying to do over here the dossier also mentions yeah. that there are terrorist camps in Afghanistan have you had conversations with the Afghan leadership over this we keep having these conversations with the Afghan leadership it, there's a there's a proper mechanism about it and uh, uh, frankly we we've, uh, we've always acknowledged uh, that uh, the Afghan government has capacity issues uh, because uh, and because of that, we've never really blamed, blamed the Afghan government for what's happening uh, from the Afghan soil. So uh, we keep sharing this information with them, and uh, it's it's a regular thing. And uh, similarly, the kind of information that we've revealed in this dossier that has also been shared at the appropriate levels. So uh, and and uh, connected to this, you know, uh, since this particular zone is also being used to target the CPEC. Uh, you know uh, what we have done to uh, act, to keep this project secure. We've raised two uh, divisions for the security of this project, and other than that, uh, we have about eight to nine regular regiments also protecting this uh, the corridor, the project uh, at various uh, locations from wherever it is passing through. Uh, and in addition to that, there is uh, there are paramilitary troops which are also deployed. So uh, we are we have taken every possible measure to keep this project secure. And uh, and our uh, Chinese partners are also very satisfied with the kind of uh, security measures that we have taken. And uh, what they are really targeting is the you know uh, the international uh, image of Pakistan. Okay. Uh, when they try and target CPAC, uh, there have been uh, the terrorists who are being used to target this project are, are continuously targeting the Chinese uh, uh, manpower involved. They try to do that. Uh, they are trying to uh, uh, target the labor, the local labor also who are working for this project. So the, there's a, there are a lot of dimensions to the kind of security threat that this project uh, gains. But uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, the kind of measures that we have taken, they've not even been able to retard the progress of this project. They've not been able to dent it. And uh, it's pro progressing more every day. OK, I'd like to bring you to the LOC right now. Um, we're seeing high levels of LOC violations by India uh, also including use of heavy military equipment, which we've never seen happening there before. Diplomats are talking about a new grand design. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, uh, the design here, uh, to put it simply, is to externalize what's happening inside India. Now, I won't go to uh, what's happening on mainland. Um, the whole world knows about that. Well, as far as Indian uh, illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir is concerned, uh, India uh, has been continuously trying to uh, tag this indigenous freedom struggle with terrorism. Uh, and these, uh, and whatever measures they are trying to take over there, uh, whatever, uh, I mean, the kind of uh, uh, increase in uh, intensity and lethality of the ceasefire violations as you see nowadays. Um, well, it all started from 2014 and uh, I think 2019 and 2020, these two years have been the, have seen the maximum uh, number of ceasefire violations and, and, I, and I believe maximum number of casualties also. Uh, what they're trying to do here is that, uh, as I said, they're trying to connect this freedom struggle with terrorism. And terrorism, they're trying to connect with infiltration, mm -hmm. so-called infiltration from Pakistan. Uh, we've been taking uh, diplomats, media, to the line of control, uh, uh, where they've seen it for themselves. Uh, there is no way uh, that 
any kind of infiltration can take place along the line of control because uh, the kind of uh, anti-counter uh, infiltration grid that they have because of the kind of deployment that they have along the line of control. You need to understand, I mean, there, is, uh, there are about uh, 9 lakh Indian soldiers inside Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And look at the kind of deployment that they have on the line of control. Mm -hmm. So the complete Pakistan army is about 6 lakh. So 9 lakh people in Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir, soldiers. Local political leadership of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir have also said that uh, if everything is hunky dory, why do we have, uh, why, why is it the most militarized region in the world? Right. So, what they are trying to achieve from these ceasefire violations is mm -hmm. that they are trying to divert the attention of the world towards Pakistan. And they are trying to claim that whatever is happening inside Indian occupied, illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir is because of the infiltration and it's because of the terrorists coming from this side of the border, whereas it's absolutely uh, false. And, uh, and, and we've said a number of times, I mean, we have a United Nations uh, observers, milita military observers group in India and Pakistan. They're always available on, on Pakistan side. They're going everywhere. They're visiting all the places. The last time I took uh, a group of ambassadors to the line of control and I, and I informed them that this particular place where they were on that particular day, it was uh, uh, pointed out by none other than the Indian Army's military chief that uh, it's, it's supposed to be a launch pad where maybe 250 odd individuals are waiting to infiltrate inside India. So, uh, it's absolutely uh, propaganda and uh, the only reason that they are doing it is one, to externalize their internal issues. Second, they want to, uh, I mean, then they understand whether they fire on us or whether we fire back, it's the Kashmiris who are being hurt on both sides. So, it is also an exercise in trying to draw a wedge between the Pakistani army and the population living along the line of control. Okay, so there's been an increase in violations along the LOC as we've just discussed um, and we're seeing a rise and surge in terrorist activities here in Pakistan as well. Uh, you've just recently given this um, complete dossier on Indian hands in terrorism in Pakistan. Yet, when Nagrota in this incident happened, the Indian government and the Indian media still played up that Pakistan must be responsible somehow. What is the pattern that you see emerging? Well, the pattern is, uh, you know, uh, you, you, we've, we've seen this happening before. We've seen this happening before. It's, it's, a, it's a regular pattern with India. It's, I mean, there's nothing new emerging here. They're always looking for, for, some kind of a, uh, for, for some kind of an excuse right. to uh, raise the temperatures. Uh, false flag operations are, uh, are a norm with them, and uh, they keep, do, keep doing that all the time. And uh, usually, usually when they... Uh, Are you suggesting the Nagrota incident was a false flag um, incident? What is there? What have they found out? Have they shared anything with the rest of the world? No. I mean, this is, this is what I'm trying to say. The, if whatever is happening inside Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, they are, frankly, I think they're in a state of denial. And... Uh, that is causing them the kind of trouble that there is. It is an indigenous freedom struggle. It is totally indigenous. It's not possible to sustain a freedom struggle for more than 70 years. It's not humanly possible for that, for that to happen. And that is exactly what is happening. So uh, Pakistan uh, on the other side, I mean, when the present government came in, your Prime, Prime Minister, Minister one step yeah, he's, forward. He's on record step forward, yeah. of having said that you move one step and I'll take two. So we've always been trying to, uh, you know, normalize. We need to normalize the situation over here in the region. And everybody understands uh, what is the potential of India and Pakistan. So uh, the, the pattern here is, I mean, and, and the, whenever there is a major event coming up in the world, anywhere else, Something happens, something that can connect Pakistan uh, to terrorism. It was interesting that you mentioned Indian propaganda as well. Um, 
social media that we're seeing right now, there's a massive increase in fake news, misinformation, disinformation about Pakistan, about the Pakistani army and so on. Um, recently, we saw the hashtag uh, trending in Twitter, civil war in Karachi. Now, you're the head of Pakistan Army's information services wing. Um, how do you intend to counter this? Can you do anything to counter this? Well, uh, it's a major challenge, uh, especially uh, what's happening on the social media. And uh, again, the best way to handle this is uh, transparency. The best way to handle this is not leaving any information voids. Uh, the best way to handle this is uh, passing on credible information. And uh, that's exactly what uh, we are trying to do here. Uh, and again, uh, uh, even on social media, uh, when we try and dig out where is it coming from, it's most of the, the accounts are Indian accounts. Only recently, uh, they've been, uh, I think they've unearthed uh, a, major, a major effort by the uh, Indians uh, in the form of uh, EU disinformation lab. And uh, the way they've been trying to uh, prop up different issues across the world. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, it's a major onslaught. Uh, the, and uh, it's a major part of the fifth generation warfare. Uh, in case of Pakistan, uh, I think Pakistan is being subjected to this, this fifth generation warfare uh, and uh, hybrid applications uh, in a massive way, in a massive way. And we're aware of that. Can you give any incidences? Can you share anything? Uh, about uh, on the fifth generation, I mean, some instances maybe that you've identified. This, uh, you know, when, when we talk of fifth generation warfare, my understanding is that you use all elements of national power uh, within a particular state uh, to concentrate on maybe two or three major spheres. Uh, in our case, uh, probably it's uh, our economy is being targeted, and the other part is the information domain. Mm -hmm. An information domain. Uh, pick out one little incident which has anything to do with Pakistan and specific, specifically to do with Pakistan army. And uh, look how it gets viral. I mean, there were there, there have been several hashtags in the last six months that uh, were even reported, uh, I mean, very trivial news which were even reported by uh, international uh, news organizations. And they were uh, pushed uh, vehemently uh, by the Indian accounts. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, links that you find on social media of some negative uh, press going for Pakistan, 90% of that is coming from Indian websites. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are so many examples. Uh, like you just said, civil war in Karachi. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happened? There was nothing on ground. Right. And then, uh, uh, and and I think by doing this, Indian media has also lost its credibility to quite an extent. And uh, the whole world is recognizing that. When we're looking at the fifth generation warfare, in which particular domain has India been targeting Pakistan? Well, uh, to put it simply, I would say uh, in the diplomatic domain, in the information domain, uh, and of course uh, the military uh, uh, engagements that they are doing, uh, what's happening on the line of control uh, in economy, in the economic domain, uh, financially, and in lawfare. So these are uh, different domains that they are uh, targeting Pakistan in. Uh, and you can see this practically uh, unfolding everywhere. It may be uh, their lobbying before we go into FATF plenaries, uh, may it be uh, uh, you know, they're uh, trying to use their influence at the United Nations Forum or different other forums in the world. Uh, it's everywhere. And uh, basically, uh, what they're trying to do is to they target Pakistan from different directions uh, to slow down our, uh, the kind of progress, uh, the kind of trajectory that Pakistan has for the future. Okay, so I'd like to take you to a slightly different field. Um, the United States and India are developing a close strategic relationship, especially in the Indo-Pacific. Um, recently, they signed the Becker deal. Limoa has been signed before that. Along with this um, Indian military spending, 
uh, is at all-time highs. Currently, they're spending $71 billion. India is the th world's third largest military, has the world's third largest military expenditure after US and China. What kind of threat perception does this create for you and how do you intend to tackle it? Well, uh, the threat perception uh, in our case is, uh, is very clear. Uh, India is uh, aiming at equipping herself with high-tech material and uh, that's what these uh, agreements are offering. Uh, whether it's uh, weapon systems, whether it's uh, classified information. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe uh, if we talk of the region, uh, whenever conventional balance is disturbed, mm -hmm. the balance of power as we call it, uh, it leads to uh, other avenues. So uh, in our case, as far as uh, we are concerned, uh, I think the differential of defense spending between India and Pakistan is almost one to nine. Uh, but we are uh, absolutely prepared for what we have in front of us and we are aware of what they are, uh, what they are acquiring. And uh, what we want to, uh, what we keep telling the, the international community and our friends in the, uh, in the rest of the world is that the uh, international community has to understand that any uh, major disturbance in the balance of power in South Asia uh, will, be a, will be a major uh, disaster for, for uh, not only for the region but uh, for all the, for also for the rest of the world. So this balance of power uh, must be maintained uh, at every level and uh, the more it is disturbed, the more it gets lopsided. Mm, the more uh, dangerous it becomes. I'd like to take you to the western border now. Um, Pakistan Army has been doing clearing operations there for the past decade. You've been uh, securing the borders. How far are these initiatives and how, will they actually give us long-term security? Yes, uh, I think we've come a long way on that account. Uh, as far as the western border is concerned, our uh, aim has been to ensure better management of this border. Mm -hmm. So we've, uh, after we, we were through with the, uh, with the operations that we were doing right now, there is uh, uh, not a single inch of uh, our uh, land along the western border which is not being manned by our soldiers. So uh, the, then we started off with the fencing because it's a very poor spot and it was a major, major undertaking. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, right now uh, we fenced about 83% of the Pakistan-Afghan border. So by the end of this month, inshallah, uh, we would have completed that. We are completed hoping the Afghan-Pakistan the Pakistan, border. Pakistan-Afghanistan part of the border that falls both in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and, Bal and Balochistan. Are you going to be going down towards Iran? Have you? Yes. As far as Pakistan-Iran border is concerned, 30% of it has been fenced so far, and I believe by December 2021 okay. we will complete that also. Okay. Now uh, there are just a few places in between which are snow-clad most of the time, mm -hmm. so uh, and the, the terrain over there is too. Uh, it's really difficult. Now, those areas uh, uh, will be manned in another in another way, uh, but we are trying to fence the hundred percent of our west. And is this going to give us the security that we're looking absolutely, for? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, we are going to. It's going to give us security. It's going to uh, stop the smuggling of goods and narcotics. And there's a, it's 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 a major dividend. It's a major dividend that we're going to get out of this thing. Then the border terminals uh, that we are uh, uh, making over there, two of the border terminals will be absolutely international standard in Chaman and Torkham. Uh, right now, five are functioning. Uh, so the passage on both sides, uh, it's going to be absolutely regularized, formalized, uh, and this is going to be a major, major uh, breakthrough for us. Uh, after we've fenced the whole border. It's already paying the dividends. It's already uh, showing. Have you done any calculations as to maybe how much terrorism has been reduced by because of the fact that you've bordered 
this fence? I mean, I think uh, I won't go into the percentage of it, but uh, the number of incidents uh, uh, has decre decreased massively. The the number of casualties have decreased. Uh, yes, uh, of late they've, they've been uh, we've seen some surge in uh, some activities along the uh, border regions, but it has uh, other connections as we as I as I uh, revealed in the dossier that we gave. Uh, there's been a massive, massive uh, uh, effort by the Indians uh, Indian side to uh, kind of create some kind of disturbance inside Pakistan, especially in the border regions. Again, uh, they're also trying to target the fencing over here. The, the, I mean, uh, the way we are trying to fence the border. Uh, we uh, keep sharing uh, whatever uh, little incidents happen along the border, uh, uh, Pagafan border, uh, in our uh, frequent press releases. Uh, so it's been, uh, I think it's brought down the incidents to, to a major extent. And one thing that I would like to add um, about uh, border management, uh, and, and it actually shows how important it is for the present civil military leadership of Pakistan. Uh, a new border management division has been recently raised. It was announced uh, by the Prime Minister. It will be functioning under the Ministry of Interior. And it will be uh, centrally articulating and managing all the points of entry, whether from sea, airports, or the land borders. Okay. It will be articulating and managing all these points of entry centrally with different agencies working under it. So the point of reiterating uh, this is that border management is key to securing Pakistan, better border management. And that is exactly what we are going for. So what do you see as the future of Afghan peace uh, process and Pakistan's role in this? As far as Pakistan's role in Afghan peace process is concerned, it's, it's that of a facilitator. Okay. Pakistan has done everything it, that it can right. to uh, facilitate the peace process. Well, it's uh, future, we're very optimistic about that. Uh, as far as uh, what happens next has to be decided by the Afghans. Nobody else but the Afghans, and that's, that's what our uh, endeavor is. We have tried to facilitate this to every extent that we could, and everybody has acknowledged that. The Afghan government, uh, the US government, the, I mean, they've, they've all acknowledged that Pakistan has played the most positive role in uh, trying to bring them on the table, trying to facilitate the talks, and to take this peace process to a logical conclusion. So that's our role in it, and that's what we'll continue doing. So military to military engagement exists in every country. It's, it's an important part of diplomacy, defense dip diplomacy. Uh, it helps to build regional partnerships and bilateral relationships and so on. How extensively have you used this um, and your current leadership? I mean, have you extensively been using this part of diplomacy? Yes, uh, I think the, uh, the Chief of Army Staff, uh, General Bajwa's uh, vision uh, as far as the military diplomacy goes is and uh, it has been we need peace within and we need peace around us and uh, Pakistan's military leadership has reached out to uh, the military leadership of countries in the region and beyond uh, our, uh, and it has it has uh, it has really uh, uh, been received very positively and uh, we've uh, had a number of advantages from this thing. Our military engagements with the, with the Chinese, our military engagements with the, with the Gulf region, uh, our military engagements uh, with, the, with the United States, Russia. Uh, it's, it's all been, uh, I think we've, we've, we've gone to, uh, we've explored new venues uh, on this account and uh, it has really helped uh, bring Pakistan's uh, international image to a new level. So the, the outreach, uh, as whether it's for training, whether it's for uh, uh, different other exchanges uh, uh, at the strategic level, and whether it's for uh, uh, 
defense equipment, buying and selling. Uh, I think it's it's in all the avenues. It's been it's been very positively received, and it's it's brought in, brought us brought us a lot of dividends on that account. Okay, so I'd like to ask you. My final question is: um, Pakistan's now going through the second wave of Corona. Um, we've seen a very strong institution, NCOC, being created during this period, which has done a fantastic job, being applauded all throughout the world on how it's managed this in Pakistan. What has been the Pakistan Army's role in supporting it? Right from the day one, uh, Pakistan Army has been uh, part of every effort that has been undertaken by the government, by the people of Pakistan to uh, control this. Uh, you've talked of NCOC. Uh, you, I'm sure uh, you may even have visited the place. Mm. Uh, it's being manned by uh, the military and uh, their civil counterparts. Uh, when we, you know, when when this uh, setup came, uh, you know, it was uh, when it, when we came up with the setup. Uh, the idea was to better articulate the resources. So uh, it worked really well. We started with you know uh, deployment of Pakistan Army soldiers across Pakistan, all across uh, when we were trying to kind of uh, exercise some smart lockdowns. The information technology part has also been uh, supplemented by the uh, ability that we, the capability that the Army has. So uh, at every level, may it be information, may it be information technology, may it be implementation and execution of different uh, instructions being given by the government. Uh, Pakistan Army has been in the thick and thin of all these things. So what has been Pakistan Army's role in during the second wave of COVID? As far as the second wave is concerned, uh, uh, I believe uh, ever since we started fighting this pandemic, there's been a lot of uh, capacity building. And uh, we've enhanced our uh, ability. We've been able to enhance our ability to fight this uh, in a better way. So the second wave, uh, as it has come in, uh, we should be we should be tackling it well, uh, and uh, and as we go through it, I, I must must acknowledge uh, the role of the frontline workers who have fought through this and who are again on the front lines, and uh, I would also like to make a special mention of uh, how the media has helped in uh, educating the masses about what this pandemic is all about and uh, how to uh, keep yourselves safe in these uh, circumstances. Uh, I think uh, ISPR being the information arm of the NCOC, um, I think we've, what we've seen uh, media, uh, the way they've contributed, uh, I believe the kind of campaigns that we've run on, uh, we've been able to run on, uh, on different channels during this pandemic, uh, it, it goes in, in, in billions of rupees and it's been uh, free of cost. So uh, it's been a very, very positive role. But I would also like to uh, emphasize here that we need to be extremely careful uh, in this second wave. And uh, we need to help each other and we need to be more careful than we were before. And only then we will be able to come out of it intact. Inshallah. General Rifska, thank you so much for your time today. That was DGISPR Major General Babur Iftikhar speaking in an interview discussing various aspects regarding CPEC, Pakistan-China friendship, along with the dossier presented to the United Nations Secretary General. For more details, stay tuned.